Good morning. I'd like to welcome you here to the First United Methodist Church of Interlochen. And so glad that you tuned in on your computer to listen to us this morning. It is Sunday, September the 27th, the last Sunday this month, and I'm so glad you could be with us to hear the Word of God and to hear the message. I do have some announcements I'd like to make to you, three different things to remind you of. Uh, remember, next Sunday, October the 4th, 2020, will be our formal communion service. So make sure you get a small piece of bread and a little bit of grape juice and set it to the side, and then when you tune in, on Sunday the 4th, you'll be ready to celebrate the Lord's Supper with us. Very meaningful experience as we reflect on what Jesus did for us on the cross. Also, the latest Bible study has resumed, meets Mondays at 1 o'clock in the Parsonage. And again, we are observing social distancing and wearing of a mask. So make sure you have that with you when you come. And if not, there'll be some there that can be provided. Also on Wednesday, October the 14th, uh, the United Methodist Women will be having their meeting at 10 a.m. in the Parsonage. So feel free to come to that, you ladies that enjoy UMW. Remember also, the church is open on Wednesdays, our main sanctuary over here to my left. You all know where that is, from 9 to 12, for a personal quiet time for prayer, devotional reading, if you just like to be able to be in the sanctuary. We have the climate controls comfortable for you, so you can come in and have a little bit of quiet time with the Lord. That's just available for anybody that would like to make use of it. Now let's have a word of prayer and we'll begin looking at what the Word of God has to say to us today. Father, again, we thank you so much that you have not left us alone to grope in the dark about life and its meaning, but you've given us the sure word of the scriptures to point our way and show us what you would have us to do. Father, thank you for the ever-living and abiding Word of God. Thank you that we have the scriptures readily available in so many different translations to help us understand what you would have us to do. Father, I pray you would fill me with the Holy Spirit. I pray you would fill all those listening with the Spirit of God, and we would understand the spiritual truth is here that we might live a more effective life for you. Father, we look to you. We put all of our trust and all of our hope in you. Father, fill us now. In Christ's name, amen. I do thank you for joining us this morning, and I guarantee you we're going to have a lively time as we look into the Word of God. I'll be coming from 1 Peter chapter 3 in the New Testament, so if you do have a Bible and you'd like to follow along, please feel free to turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. That's where we'll be beginning our message today. Uh, I had a good friend of mine that lived out in the Panhandle little country town called Chipley. Many of you might know where that is, off Interstate 10. And he and his wife had a nice old farmhouse out there that they were renting. And his wife, Karen, had a plaque up on the wall in the kitchen over top of her sink. And that plaque said, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. And I think there's a really important truth in that as far as having a satisfied wife, a happy wife, a happy life dissatisfied wife, a life, a dissatisfied wife. 
you understand my gist of this kind of going. And it's really important, you know, when I was studying and preparing earlier this week, I thought to myself, you know, I can really get myself in a world of trouble, Lord, with this message. But then the Lord said, no, you don't, David. Just preach and teach what is there, and the word will speak for itself. Now, if you remember back in chapter 2, just by way of a review, uh, Peter was basically telling the Christians of his day, the congregation of his day, to be submissive to the authorities. Remember back in 2.13, he says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether the king as the supreme authority or to governors. Then down in verse 18, he told slaves to be submissive to their masters with all respect. And again, we applied that to the employer-employee relationship, since praise God, slavery is no among among us these days. So when we start out in chapter 30, excuse me, chapter 3 of 1 Peter, notice it says, wives in the same way. He's talking about submissiveness. He says, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. Let's break this apart, okay? Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands. You know, back when I was in Bible college, there was a young freshman, about 18 years old, running around the school saying that all the girls ought to be submissive to the guys in the college. They ought to be willing to do their wash, to dust their rooms, and take care of them because women are supposed to be in submission. Well, he got laughed right out of the school almost as an older professor corrected him that if you look closely, a wife is supposed to be submissive to her own husband. That's all she has to worry about. She doesn't have to worry about pleasing every guy in the neighborhood, okay? Children will be just submissive to their parents, but a wife is to be submissive to her own husband. And look at the reason. So that if any of them do not believe the word, if you're a wife and you have an unbelieving husband, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. Ladies, the way you live, the way you carry yourself, the way you interact with your husband, if you do have an unbelieving husband, will speak a whole lot louder than what you say. You can speak up from time to time and share your thoughts, but sometimes people feel like they're being preached to, and that can be a turnoff at times if it's done over and over again. But the way you live, the way you carry yourself, if you're submissive to your husband, even if he is an unbeliever and not church-oriented, will make a whole lot of difference. Paul says that if any of them do not believe the word, an unbelieving husband, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. And then look at verse 2. When they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your life will show as you're living for the Lord. He'll see you reading the scriptures. He'll see you how you carry yourself. He'll see how you interact with Him and everything like that. And that purity and reverence that you have for the Lord can make a lot of difference. Ladies, I've heard some prayer stories before where a believing wife was married to an unbelieving husband. She kept praying, kept living for the Lord, and after 40 years, the old goat finally trusted the Lord. And what a blessing when you hear those kind of stories. That testimony is going to show through and make a big difference. So keep living for the Lord. I know it's hard if you've got a stubborn husband. I know it's difficult, but just do what God would have you to do. And God will honor that, and hopefully he'll be one over time. Now, as we pick up at verse 3, Peter says something very important. He says, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as braided hair and the wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. You know, sadly to say, some people have taken this verse out of its context and really twisted it. You have certain strict churches these days that will insist that women should not ever wear makeup at all. They should all let their hair grow as long as possible because of a passage over in Corinthians where it says if a woman has long hair, it's a glory unto her, for her, her hair is given to her as a covering. But these strict churches will teach a woman has to wear no makeup, have long straight hair, always wear a dress, never wear a pantsuit or anything like that because of this verse. But Peter doesn't say not to do these things. He just says your true beauty shouldn't come from these things. 
Remember, he's talking to a Greco-Roman world where women wore excessive makeup. There was a lot of gold and flattering and braided hair and things like that. And he's contrasting how Christian women carry themselves modestly compared to how the world carries themselves. And all you have to do is look at our current television shows and see the way some of these models and women on TV are made up. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. That's not really true beauty. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as braided hair and the wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. Instead, and here's the important point Peter makes, it should be that of your inner self, literally the inner man, a true beauty of the heart. The unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. That's where a woman's true beauty lies. Even in the book of Proverbs, it says, Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she is the one that shall be praised. So your spirit, your heart, the kind of way how you carry yourself is the really true beauty of a woman. And I love that phrase, a gentle and quiet spirit. Not that you can't get excited from time to time when you hear something good that you like. Not that you can't laugh and live a life, but you're characterized by being a very gentle person and having that quiet kind of spirit. Then Peter is going to use an illustration from the Old Testament to show us what he's talking about. He says in verse 5, For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God, these are Old Testament saints, holy women in the past, used to make themselves beautiful. How? By a gentle and quiet spirit. They were submissive to their own husbands. Notice that like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her master. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Uh, Sarah, her name Sarai at the time, she was married to Abram and they lived in Ur of the Chaldees. And one day out of the blue, if you read Genesis chapter 12, Abram comes home and says, Sarai, we're moving to Canaan. Well, Abraham, where's Canaan at? I'm not exactly sure, but God told me to go to Canaan. Well, wait a minute, Abram. God told you to go to Canaan, so we're going to up and move to Canaan all of a sudden? Yeah. Well, Sarai went along with Abram. She, she obeyed him. She even referred to him as her master, that kind of thing. She showed him that respect and showed him that trust that she was going to have that gentle and quiet spirit. Sometimes, ladies, it's hard to do, but if you really trust and depend on God, God will really bring you through shining. And notice that last phrase of encouragement, you are her daughters, daughters of Sarah, if you do what is right, and look at this, do not give way to fear. Sometimes your husbands will make a decision that you be very fearful about. You're not exactly sure if that's the best thing he should do. Don't let that fear take over you. Remember what David said, what time I'm afraid, I will trust in God. David also said, I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. John says, perfect love casts out all fear, for fear has torment. He that has fear is not made perfect in love. So continue loving the brute, continue being submissive as much as you can, trust God, and don't give way to fear. The enemy will use fear to creep into a relationship and try to undermine it. You know, as I was studying this passage, I came one, one evening and I said, uh, Carol, you start, got, start calling me Lord or Master. We all know Carol. She just raised her eyebrows up and looked at me. <laughs> I started laughing and she started laughing. No, not that you imitate exactly what Sarah did, but you just show respect for your husband. You show love and care, again, flowing out of that inside lady, the lady that has that gentle and quiet spirits. Now, husbands are addressed here in verse 7 and only one verse. Ladies are given verses 1 through 6, and then husbands are addressed at verse 7. Husbands, in the same way. Stop right there. What is the same way? Look back at verse 1. Wives in the same way. We're talking about submission. Husbands are also to be submissive to their wives. Their wives. Submissiveness is mutual. It's a give and take relationship. It's not a man lording it over a woman at all times trying to dominate her. 
It's a man and woman living together being submissive to one another. In like manner, a husband should be submissive also. And look what it says. In the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives. Men, we have to have a deep consideration and be sensitive and gentle with our wives if we're going to have a good marriage. You know, in the past, I remember counseling with a couple. And each one of the couple, the man and the woman, each knew what the other's responsibility was, and that's what they wanted to talk about. The guy kept saying, she's supposed to be in submissiveness to me and do what I say. And the woman would scream back at him, yeah, and you're supposed to love me like Christ loved the church. They each knew what the other's responsibility was, but they really weren't taking into consideration what their responsibility and men, I'm driving this home with you because I guarantee you, if you use submissiveness in this scripture as a hammer, I guarantee you it'll come with disastrous results. A lot of couples haven't made it, haven't gotten together, and have wound up losing their marriage over this kind of, of control that some men feel like they have to exercise. If you don't have that controlling spirit, if you're considerate, you'll go a whole lot further. Remember, you can catch more flies with honey then you can vinegar. Husbands, in the same way, again, being submissive, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect. Remember, we're supposed to treat all people with respect, but especially our wives. Have a respectful attitude with them. And look what it says. Treat them with respect as the weaker partner. You know, I've had some people say, well, how are women exactly weaker from men? Are they weaker emotionally? No. I don't think so. I have seen a lot of strong women in my time. In fact, I remember a movie called Steel Magnolias about these ladies in Louisiana that had a close friendship together and how they weathered the storms of life with strong emotions. They cried at times when they needed to, but they rejoiced when they needed to and they had each other's backs. I think the only way women are weaker is physically. Men are generally stronger. Every now, Carol will say out in the kitchen, hey, honey, could you come in and open this jar up for me? She couldn't open, so I have to open the jar. And with her height, if she needs something up high in the cabinet, I'm up there to reach it for her. I call her, tell her she's a shorthorn, but I think it's cute as a button. I really do. But uh, that's how we, we help one another and, and have that kind of a spirit, you know, that it makes things be the way they should be. The only way she's weaker is in physical strength. And look at this. And as heirs together of the gracious gift of life. You know, I want to share with you a verse tucked over in the book of Galatians. And this is Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28. And Galatians 3.28 says about salvation, about a person's worth before God, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Being in a submissive role does not mean that a woman is inferior. A woman is just as equal to a man and a man to a woman. They're both created by God. They're both important. And we should never let our wives feel like they are second-class citizens. So, so important. We are heirs together of the gift of life. And then he ends it with this last clause, so that nothing, nothing, not a thing, will hinder your prayers. Men, do you have a good prayer time and a good prayer life with your wife? Do you all get together and pray about different things in the family and read a little scripture together? You know, my attitude toward my wife and how I'm treating her can affect my prayer life. And I might not have some important prayers answered if I'm not doing the right thing. Scripture assumes that Christian men and Christian women are praying together. And I encourage you to develop that as a pattern, as a habit, It'll draw you closer and help you gain respect and love for one another. So again, women are called to be submissive, but in the same way, men are called to be submissive and considerate also. So it goes both ways. You know, we have a couple members in our congregation here that have been married over 50 years. I think of Pam and John Steiner. I think of uh, Brenda and Denny Smith. And uh, they could probably get up here and give you a seminar on what it means to be married and get along. And they both have good, solid marriages that have stood the test of time. And knowing John and knowing Denny, they're so respectful to their mates 
but it makes such a big difference. And they're praying couples, they spend time together. And remember, if mom ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Very, very important. Now he's going to go on, and we're going to look at it a little deeper as we move on verse 8, addressing all of us other than just husbands and wives. Peter says, finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. You know, I, I don't know about you, but I think you probably feel the same way I do. I like to get along with people and be at peace. Scripture en encourages us to live in harmony with one another, be sympathetic, be understanding, realize people go through tough times like you have, be that kind of person who's sympathetic. Love as brothers. Just like brothers should love in a family, we as Christians are to love one another. Hadn't Peter said that before a few times in this book? With pure, fervent love, love one another deeply out of your heart. Love one another. Be compassionate and humble. Willing to give somebody else the right of way. Willing to let somebody go through the door ahead of you. Willing to defer to somebody else. So, so important as we live a Christian life. And like we saw last week with Jesus, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing. Remember last week when the scripture said when Jesus was unjustly suffering, when he was reviled, he did not revile back. When he was insulted, he did not insult back, but instead he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Try to be a blessing to somebody. Don't return an insult. Instead, take it to God in prayer. Then he goes on and says, For this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. Here's a quotation out of Psalm 34. For whoever would love life and see good days. Don't you want to love life and see more good days than bad days? Must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. Folks, over and over again, Scripture talks on the importance of what we say. I remember when I was a little kid, I would hear, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Well, to be all honest, names did hurt us, didn't they? They did inflict wounds. They did cause pain. So be so, so careful what you have to say. If you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. But try to encourage someone. Try to compliment someone. Be a person that lives up on the positive frame of life. I've heard politicians say, if they take the low road, we're going to take the high road. Let's us be people that take that high road. Not repaying evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing. Whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. Being honest as we possibly can. He must turn from evil and do good. Turn away from anything the scripture says is wrong or evil, and instead do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. See if you can be a peacemaker. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called the children of God. You ever found yourself in the middle of a family squabble or a family debate, and you're the one in the middle? You finally get this person settled down over here, and this person over here will flare up, so you run over there and you give your attention and you get that person to settle down and then a short time later this one flares back up. You can feel so, so torn because you love both people. What can you do? If you can't make peace sometimes, all you can do is take a step back and pray. Put it in the Lord's hands and ask Him, the ultimate peacemaker, to make peace between those folks that are arguing. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and look at this, His ears are attentive to their prayer. When we're doing the right thing, when we're obeying God, not that we'll ever be sinlessly perfect, but as we're growing and maturing, moving toward maturity, perfection as they call it in the message is faith, when you're a mature person, when you're mature, God will hear your prayers and be attentive to your prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So here in this passage, Peter has addressed wives and husbands, and he's addressed all of us as a congregation as a whole. Wives are supposed to be submissive to their husband with their inner beauty flowing out of their soul, a gentle and quiet spirit. In the same way, men being submissive are to be considerate to their wives, 
They're to treat them as the weaker vessel because they're not as physically strong as we are. Make sure that they're an heir together of the throne of, of grace and life with us and make sure you have that praying relationship. And then all of us live in harmony, be sympathetic, love as brothers, be compassionate and humble. Why? That Old Testament principle. Whoever would love life and see good days, more good than bad, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from deceitful speech. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. When I was a kid during the Vietnam War, everybody was shooting the peace sign. It meant victory in World War II, the V sign, but then it was turned into peace during that time. Be a person that shoots peace signs, not literally, but spiritually as you go about your life. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are attentive to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your clear teaching about a marriage relationship, how submission is mutual and a man is to be considerate with his wife. I pray all of us, Father, would take these things to heart and not worry so much about what somebody else's responsibility is, but what our responsibility is and how we treat our spouse and how we treat other people in the church and all of those around us. Father, thank you for the Old Testament psalm which reiterates this teaching, tells us the good things that we can do. And I just pray, Father, you'd help us by the Holy Spirit, apply this to our lives and be people following Jesus, looking like Jesus in everything we do. We ask your power and your grace, Father, to help us flesh and live this out. In Christ's name.